Hi, folks. I'm Steve Adubato. This is a very special event. Yes, it's virtual, but no less special. This is the 25th Russ Berry Making a Difference Awards ceremony. Now, listen, of course, because of COVID-19, um, we can't be together this year. Cross our fingers next year we will. But this year we're doing this virtually. 1997. 1997 was the first year that the Rustbury Award started. Um, let's go to 2021. So that's 25 years. Get these numbers. These numbers are powerful. These statistics are staggering in a good way. Over 3,800 unsung heroes have been nominated. 380 individuals have been honored from every corner of the state. And $3.75 million have been awarded in these presentations and these award ceremonies that, by the way, by the way, I've been honored to have been moderating and hosting from the beginning. Now, some of the nominations came in before the pandemic. Some of them came in after the pandemic. But all of the nominees, all of those who we recognize in this virtual event are making a huge, huge difference in their communities. Um, let's kick things off. So a while back, I had the opportunity to sit down with Angelica Berry, who you know is the president of the uh, board of trustees of the Russell Berry Foundation, and Scott Berry, who is the vice president of the board. Now, what did we talk about in the conversation you're about to see? Obviously, we talked about Russ. We talked about his legacy. We talked about the reasons why there's a Making a Difference Awards. And we talked about all the difference that has been made in these past 25 years. Let's check out that compelling conversation. Let's go back, okay? 25 years ago. So Russ first brings up the idea of the awards, the Making a Difference Awards. Angelica, your first reaction was? I thought it was a harebrained idea. <laughs> I said, how are you going to find all these people? I didn't think it was going to fly. There were too many um, logistical things that we were not equipped to do. And fortunately, we had a wonderful partner in Ramapo, and it, it worked out. And it turned out to be one of his brightest and most heartwarming ideas. I thought it was an interesting idea and an interesting way to really um, set examples and to get um, images of people doing things uh, for the greater good that could be transmitted mm -hmm. to uh, other people to do things that perhaps would not be recognized for the great things that they do, but set an example. Well, Russ was uh, one of a kind. He was unique in his um, character and he was comfortable in his own skin. I guess my anecdote for my father is that he was a big teddy bear. And mm -hmm. in many ways, although he came across as a very uh, powerful and assertive uh, businessman, he also um, would cry at the drop of the hat watching a movie, uh, you know, that had some sentimentality to it. When you think about the people who've won this award, over 300, well over 300 honorees of the, uh, for the Making a Difference Awards over 25 years, those are some of the traits, just some of the traits that talk about who Russ was and why he still matters today. I think they're all social entrepreneurs. And Russ would have loved that because he himself was very entrepreneurial. They were, in a sense, like him. They weren't afraid to go where others feared to tread. And um, they were not afraid to be pioneers. And I think that every one of them was unique in the work that they do. And these are traits that I feel reflect some of the best traits of Russ. You know, he had an ability to relate to uh, just about everybody. So um, I think he would consider this part of his family. And, uh, all, you know, all the people who have been have received these rewards over the years, part of his extended family. I want to thank Angelica and Scott for that powerful and compelling conversation. Now, let's let's introduce our first honorees. Uh, 19 awards are being presented at this virtual ceremony. Um, now, as you know, the 2020 ceremony was canceled and we're recognizing honorees from 2020 and 2021 today. So the first group of honorees. Let's talk about them. These are people who are providing young people in New Jersey with opportunities to reach their full potential. Um, they've improved the lives of thousands of children in education and the arts. They deal with issues of social equity, racial justice. These are people who are making a huge difference in the lives of young people. Let's take a look. Paul 
Winslow from East Hanover, founder of Students to Science, brings together the public and private sectors to change the life trajectory of students from underserved communities through STEM education with real-world applications and real-world solutions. I often tell people there's blue collar, there's white collar, and there's no collar, and I was in the class of no collar. And um, so I grew up in a, a small town south of Boston and uh, was fortunate enough to uh, graduate from high school and go on to college. Got a job at Union Carbide in the Specialty Polymers and Composites Division. I bought a small testing laboratory in Madison, uh, New Jersey. Uh, I did that for about another three, four years. And then I went out on my own and started a, um, a brand new company called QTI. And I sold that in 2007. I woke up one day and I was deathly afraid that I would have nothing to do. So um, one of the things I decided was that education made the difference in my life. And so I decided to start um, Students to Science. From day one, our mission has been the same and has not changed. To inspire, motivate, and educate students from underserved communities to pursue careers in science, technology, engineering, and math. You know, 90 plus percent of the students that come to our facility are in underserved communities. I can tell you back in March of, of last year, uh, you know, March 16th was the day when we shut our laboratories down. I didn't think S2S would survive or ever open up again, okay? And that was a very sad day for all of us. We all gathered together and we just, you know, we're like, well, we did the best we could. But we not only survived, but we thrived. And we only thrived because of the hard work, dedication and diligence of all the people involved. And we're really, really excited about opening back up in September and coming back even stronger. So, so that's what it means to me. Wilhelmina Holder, Newark, is president of Newark Secondary Parents Council and co-director of the High School Academic Support Program. Decades after having children in the public education system, she continues to advocate for equity and opportunity for young people in Newark public schools. My uh, work in education was came about because of when my children entered middle school, actually. I was a volunteer at the Boys and Girls Club in New York, and um, there was something consistent and troubling for me in that the ones that came in could not read well. And I used to complain a lot about that to the directors and the other volunteers and people at the Boys and Girls Club. And one of them, my dear friend said to me, well, do something about it. I was sort of pushed into. <laughs> I'd like to say that I believe in justice and I'm just perplexed as to why systems don't really work well for people. And then the understanding is we have to educate people about their place in the system and how they have to engage. So we found there was a lack of information. So we do advocate for adequate funding for schools. I could go advocate and speak at the New Jersey State Legislature because you have to organize people, you have to inform people, help them, I, I love seeing the young people, some young adults now, some young children who say to me, my life has made better. I think for me, that's the biggest joy, that people trust me and believe in me and give me an opportunity to share their lives. There's no greater joy. Larry Abrams of Cherry Hill is founder of Book Smiles, a champion of literacy. He is combating book deserts in South Jersey by collecting and redistributing books so that underserved children have a personal library at home, what Larry calls book wealth to develop good literacy skills. There are tens of thousands of children who still don't have books in their homes. We need mm -hmm. to find a pipeline. We are that pipeline. We are that bridge to get books into the hands and homes of babies and kids who don't have books. We want them to just have the hardware around and the reading will follow if the hardware mm -hmm. is there. We want children to become emissaries, to give baby board books to younger brothers and sisters. That's a beautiful thing. When I'm at book fairs and we're giving books to children and they kind of timorously ask, well, how much is it? Because they're used to 
you know, that other um, wonderful uh, book fair organization, but oftentimes they can't afford the books or they don't have the money. And so they're kind of used to that. And then when they ask, how much is it? We say, well, oh, the only thing it will cost you is a smile. You know, we're book smiles. What we do is we upcycle books and that is what gives me joy. Saving books from going into the trash, saving books from getting yellowed on shelves and making sure that children who live in book deserts get great books too. Sharon Miller of Montclair is founder of Sharon Miller's Academy for the Performing Arts. For over 25 years, Sharon has expanded arts education access for thousands of underserved New Jersey young people, primarily children of color. My mother was an educator and her philosophy was knowledge is power. And no matter what you choose to do, educate yourself in that area. And if it's your passion, your passion will allow when you learn everything about that to not only achieve, but to share that achievement. Not only does Sharon now lead an academy for the performing arts, but she also runs programs for inner city schools and children with special needs and learning disabilities. I see so many kids who've never had the opportunity to be transformed through the arts and they see a dance move. And it could be just a creative movement move. A spiral sit into the floor and get up and then say, yay! Suddenly there's engagement, suddenly there's enthusiasm, and there's a desire for more. So they become what they've always been, which is a sponge for learning. But unfortunately, I think in our educational system and particularly in our underserved communities, the arts are considered an addendum. They're not considered necessarily an essential. I love what I do. I love children. And I sincerely believe that the arts can transform a life. Rosa Zaremba from South Plainfield founder of Mexican Alliance of New Jersey, helps young people in Latinx communities explore college and career options by connecting them with mentors and learning opportunities. My guidance counselor really took the time to educate me and told me about scholarships um, and showed me the possibilities of getting into college. I was working full time um, and in order to pay for my education, Thankfully, I was able to get two or three scholarships that pay for two years of my college. And uh, through college, I made some connections that led me to my first big job after college. I began to see things differently and understand that maybe I could do a little bit more. After transitioning to um, a community college where I worked um, in uh, Middlesex County College, actually, and talking to those students really made me realize um, that I needed to do more and really give back to those students that needed that guidance. They didn't know their options of going to college in, you know, aside from a county college, what other options do they have? So it, through that whole journey and process, I was able to um, create the nonprofit MOF New Jersey where we provide educational services to high school, college and recent grad students. And everyone who joins the organization has the same, they have to have the same vision. And it's that they can help the second generation. They can help their younger uh, siblings or their cousins or a stranger and break that cycle of not knowing. Emma and Quinn Joy of South Orange are the founders of Girls Helping Girls, period. They address one of the most overlooked and underdiscussed issues facing low-income women today, period poverty. Emma and Quinn embody the spirit of making a difference while advocating and educating others to erase the stigma surrounding menstrual health. We were not aware that this was an issue, that there was no government program in place to help women um, with this basic need. The mission from the get-go is we want girls and women or whoever needs these products to stay in school. 
because they shouldn't have to miss parts of their education due to this basic need. We absolutely see a difference um, in just working with our clients, whether it be at a food pantry or a women's shelter, or even if it's just someone who's reached out that we are directly put into contact with, right away when we give them the products, they their faces light up. And so any little bit of spreading the word on what is going on um, helps to put pressure on people to make those products available to more people. Recognition is, it's not, I know Emma will agree with me, it's not about putting our names on anything. It's not about saying, you know, we started this, we did this, it's just about expanding the conversation and making this a group effort. That's really what it's about for me. Obviously an amazing group of honorees that are making a difference in the lives of others. Now this next group of honorees, they're not afraid to stand up for the rights of others. Now um, this past year obviously has been difficult in many ways, not just because of COVID, which has been bad enough, but events have shown that hate, racism, and systematic injustice sadly clearly still exist in our communities. So this next group of honorees has been standing up for the rights of others and fighting for justice and equity. They are changing the world and here they are. Cheryl Olitsky of North Brunswick is the founding director of Sisterhood of Salam Shalom whose mission is to build trust, respect, and relationships between Muslim and Jewish women and teenage girls. Her inspiration for the group came after a trip she took to the Auschwitz concentration camp in Poland. I said, you know what? The Holocaust happened because not enough people rose up and took action. I'm going to go home and take action. And I feel terrible that I really don't have a circle of Muslim friends, and, I, and I'm not in the community to help protect them and speak out. I'm going to change that. Cheryl reached out to a local mosque and was introduced to Ataya Afteb, and their journey began. We started our little chapter, one chapter, in about 2010. So by April of 2016, we had 25 chapters. By November, we had 50, and we now have about 180, of which 20 are teenage girl chapters. We have a total of 9,000 women, and the whole premise of the sisterhood is that it's easy to hate someone you don't know. But when you know them, it's harder to hate them, and when you care and love them, it's impossible. It's all about listening with your heart. It's all about seeing the world through someone else's eyes, not your eyes. And saying that, you know what? Difference is good. We can celebrate those differences and I as a person can grow because of those differences. Amanda Bacosia of Bloomfield is founder of The Gem Project, which educates young people about critical issues affecting their communities. Through activism and service learning, youth strengthen skills of leadership and community organizing. It started off at the idea where peers can educate their peers, but today the CHEM project has completely um, evolved into really focusing how we can leverage the power of young people within the age groups of 16 to 24 and through a a fellowship model, one that utilizes organizing with youth power. And so we have impacted over two, 3,000 um, young people and young adults. And what's so interesting about it is during um, the pandemic, it has allowed us to stretch our arms and our reach beyond North New Jersey. So we have fellows who come from Florida, fellows um, and based out of Virginia, New York, and all over. They literally go through the different types of um, process as known as youth organizing. So they provided their own set of demands. And ultimately what ended up happening towards the end of the summer, they were able to kick off a huge rally online that really garnered a lot of um, community participation over 1,000 um, or 2,000 or so views. And so that is going to be another great opportunity to truly amplify youth voice. 
Kim Gaddy of Newark has spent more than 20 years on the front lines fighting for environmental justice in New Jersey communities of color, starting in her own South Ward neighborhood. I'm a fourth generation Newarker. I have lived in the city of Newark all my life. When I started in the environmental field, it was because of my children. I have three children and all of them are asthmatic. And it wasn't until my daughter was diagnosed at the age of one that I began to say, oh my God, what is going on? What can I do uh, to kind of prevent the asthma rates, not only in North, but throughout the state? Um, because the one thing, when you see a kid gasping for air, you have no control over that. And so that started my fight 20 years ago. So living in the city of Newark and the South Ward community, my backyard is the third largest port. And we have an airport as well. And what I noticed is that the cumulative impacts of pollution was directly linked to low-income residents and residents who are people of color. And so I began to make the connection with the environmental injustices that was happening and the poor health that our community suffered from. One out of four children in the city of Newark have asthma versus one out of 10 in the Excess County uh, surrounding towns. And so when I heard that statistic, I said something has to be done and what is actually causing this? And I began to investigate the environmental degradation, the pollution sources, the increase in trucks. You know, we have 25,000 trucks that come in and out of the port and so that is something that can be easily resolved with electrification of the vehicles, making sure we are changing out the different oils that we use to run some of the equipment, also rerouting the trucks from coming into the neighborhood where children reside. Well, you know, what I'm most proud of, uh, working with the South Water Environmental Alliance, uh, Clean Water Action, Ironbound Community Corp and New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance, we had a fight for about 13 years to get the first environmental justice cumulative impacts law passed. And it was finally voted on and passed by the legislation and signed by the governor in 2020. And that's a 13 year fight. The environmental justice cumulative impacts bill will begin to change the future of our community. And then lastly, we have to be able to pass on the information to the next generation so the fight doesn't end with a Kim Gaddy or another person. That this is something that has sustainability. Well done. Clearly, these three women have had an extraordinary impact on the lives of others. Now, before we go to the next group of honorees, um, you're going to hear some messages of congratulations from three people who know the Berry Foundation well, who know the Making a Difference Award so well. They've been a part of it for 25 years. And here's who they are. We're talking about Governor Tom Kane, United States Senator Cory Booker, and State Senator Loretta Weinberg. And here are their powerful words. Well, first of all, congratulations. I mean, you've really made a difference. And you've made a difference by recognizing people who made a difference. That's been important over the years. And uh, we need more people like that. We need more people, the kind of people you recognize. We need, we need you. So look, you've done a wonderful job for 25 years. Keep it up. Well, we should recognize them quarter of a century. Uh, that is uh, really, uh, frankly, a record of making a difference. And this is why, and we all know this, the, the, re the everyday heroes of America, the people that deserve recognition are often those that don't get it. And, and we are especially seeing that now uh, during this pandemic and economic crisis. We are seeing heroes uh, every single day out there doing extraordinary things, and we should be highlighting them. And so their quarter century record of doing just that elevating uh, not just folks, but really inspiring us all with their stories. Um, it, it is just so critical, the work that they're doing, and I'm just grateful for them, quarter century strong, and I'm wishing them a uh, continuance uh, in their uh, being light workers who shed light on other light workers. Well, first of all, congratulations, Mazel Tov, for 25 years of recognizing people who don't ordinarily get recognized 
people who are working just under the radar screen, just a little bit in the background, but make a real difference. It is the Raspberry Foundation, and I knew Raspberry, and I know uh, Angelica Berry, who has done such good work to not only bring a spotlight on people who have made such a difference, but provide them with resources to sometimes continue making a difference. Mm -hmm. So congratulations on your 25th anniversary. Thank you, Governor, Senator, and Senator. Now, this next group of honorees is very unique. Uh, each one of them has had very painful and difficult experiences in their lives. But they've taken those experiences and decided to make a difference in the lives of others. They decided to take their pain and put it all that energy, put all of that energy into helping others who are experiencing similar, very difficult and painful circumstances. Here they are. Donna York from Hillsboro is founder of Hark ALS, which provides financial and emotional support for families affected by ALS. She started the organization after caring for her father during his battle with ALS. I don't know how else to describe this disease. And the biggest challenge is nobody understands that, that hasn't witnessed it firsthand. It's so hard to explain to people that you can be 100% cognizant, your mind is as sharp as ever, but you cannot move one muscle in your body. It has been described by ALS patients as being buried alive. It costs $200,000 a year plus to take care of an ALS patient at home. I work with families now where the only one taking care of the husband is the wife 24 seven, and it, they just can't sustain that. So to keep your loved one at home, you need ramps. And then the other thing, which is, which is really important for, for families, for especially ALS patients with children, and even without, is a handicap accessible van because if they don't have one, they are prisoners in their home. But there's very few resources that help ALS patients financially. And the way we help with that is we work with the family and we host a fundraiser for them so that they, they reach out to their community, their friends and their family, to help them get what they need. Because people want to help you. They just don't know how. We're giving them the means to help you. You're gonna need it. And nobody can handle, no one can deal with this disease by themselves. Paul Nichols from Hackensack is the creator of the Homeless Resource Guide and an advocate for the homeless. Pulling from his own experiences, Paul provides a voice for those who have been silenced by their struggles. One morning 10 years ago, Paul woke up homeless and decided to make a change. When I was trying to get back on my feet and going to certain Certain things you had to do to say, like get food stamps and Medicaid. Um, you'd go to the office, you'd fill things out, and they'd tell you to bring this, this, and this. And then, but when you went back with this, this, and this, they'd say, oh, now you gotta bring this, that, and that. I was like, no, this ain't happening no more. And at the end of my process, I wrote it all down and put it in the guide and started handing them out to everybody. And that was one of the starter points. And it just evolved into, online and then to help people with housing and building a big huge network with my church the river mission and transition professional just all kinds of wonderful things burden county uh, has so many resources but a lot of people don't know what they are still paul's guide is now mandated for use by the court system and distributed to those dealing with homelessness and mental health issues in bergen county Whoever needs the help, wherever I'm guided to tomorrow or after we're done, my phone might ring. That's where I'm guided to. Lynn Regan of Farmingdale founded CFC Loud and Clear Foundation after witnessing her son Dan's agonizing struggle with addiction. She created a successful relapse prevention model that has helped thousands of young people achieve long-term sober living. He'd been to so many treatment centers and every treatment center he went to, he came out a better drug addict with more individuals that he can hang out with. This system is gonna kill him. So what is what can I do? 
I sent him to this different place. This different place changed his life. It changed his life. But in the end, it's only 28 days long. I mean, you're not fixing somebody in 28 days. So this is a lifelong journey. I started talking to all the aftercare specialists in the rehabs that he had been to. And I know from this rehab, this resonated. And from this rehab, this resonated. So I'm like, okay, we're gonna put together this aftercare program for you, Dan. So we did this and we did this for a year. And within that year, he was sober and his friends were coming to Dan at my kitchen table going, dude, how are you sober? Can you please help make a plan for me? And we started a sober social community of full of uh, sober social activities, uh, meetings, and reco literally recovery plans to hold each other. It's an accountability program. And now we're 15,000 families deep for an aftercare program. And what it's doing is rebuilding lives one, one at a time. Talk about amazing. I mean, so many people have benefited from the commitment that the honorees that you just saw on video at this virtual event, um, the actions that they are taking to help others. Now, this next group of honorees, I mean, this is so interesting. These are people who in a split second had to decide what to do, what to do in terms of jumping in, leaning in very heavily to help others who are in danger. The question is, what would you do? What would I do? I'm not so sure, but I know that these people that you're about to see are genuine heroes. Affectionately known as the Rescuers, Kieran Foley, Joseph Dietrich, Drew Scalisi, Ryan Day, and Tyler Armigan of Middletown, New Jersey, created a human chain to save two small children whose sled entered an icy pond on a cold December day. It was really icy. Everything was really icy. Sliding around, we were falling down the hills and everything. And we went down to check out the pond. And we were like, it was sloshy. It wasn't really frozen over completely. We were just messing around in the pond. And then we saw the sled come down. We saw the kids in the water. And I thought, like, hey, nobody else is doing anything. Let me just not walk in there and grab them and say, get them out of the water. So. Instinct is the biggest thing. And I think it was, for these guys, was their Boy Scouts. And we're all very close with each other. We're really tight. So this, all this bonding time led us to this one moment and it went perfect. Everyone was involved, we teamwork, it was great. My dad and the church, they taught me to put others before yourself. And that definitely, that lesson was brought to the test to that day and up for all of us. And we did great, we passed the test. Sister Frances Saleme has been an educator in Jersey City for more than four decades. Her steadfast presence at Sacred Heart School has improved the lives of thousands of children and families in the community. I have been in Jersey City for over 45 years. Well, actually at Sacred Heart for 45 years. St. Patrick's, which is about a mile away, uh, for four years. So, um... I just love it here. I love the children. I love serving the poor because that's what the Sisters of Charity mission is, to, to reach out to the poor. We're kind of like a beacon of hope in this area. And um, it's really all about empowerment um, of education. It transforms their lives. On December 10th, 2019, she and her staff saved the lives of their students as two attackers ambushed a kosher grocery store across from the school. In the hours-long shootout with police that ensued, four people and the attackers were killed and the school was riddled with bullets. I was in this room and having a meeting and we heard shots, which is not unusual. However, then it sounded like a machine gun and we knew that there was something else going on. The shooting was across the street from the second grade. We realized that they needed to evacuate that classroom. And so we went in there, some of the staff, and had the children crawl out 
to this, uh, the opposite side of the hallway. So it was a matter of um, just staying in place until it was time to, to move, which was, at one point we moved to the basement. We, ex we exit the building uh, because there was a pipe bomb in the van. And you also saw the little students, you know, helping each other, holding hands. There were little kids that were crying. I think the last child was picked up around seven o'clock. And what I remember afterwards is that the goodness of people. I was so overwhelmed the days that followed, how people responded to us. Um, the man who bought ice cream for 200 kids, the nonprofit in Jersey City who stood outside when the kids came out, gave them each a flower to make them happy, uh, and the phone calls and the support from the diocese, Sisters of Charity, parents, uh, as one parent said, she called and she said, you know, sister, you promised to keep our children safe and you kept your word. But uh, I still am overwhelmed by the goodness of people. As I said, this is a neighborhood school and I am really happy to be able to minister to the neighborhood and to offer an education that will empower our children to reach their potential. As Mr. Berry said there, that whole thing about uh, making a difference well, we all should make a difference and try to leave this world a little better. Anthony Capuano of Jersey City was in the right place at the right time. As a lifeguard and swim instructor, Anthony knew he couldn't stand on the sidelines as he saw a car sinking in the Newark Bay with the driver trapped inside. The cold November water or even his prosthetic leg didn't stop Anthony from jumping into the water to save the driver who, unknown to Anthony, could not swim. In 2009, Anthony and his brother were taking a shortcut to get across town. I was on my way to get my lifeguard certification, and then what happened was the train was coming, and I was uh, moving, and I tried to uh, be a daredevil, and long story short, got hit by the train, and um, it uh, took off my leg. Quick thinking from his brother and fast reactions from EMTs saved Anthony's life, but not his leg. He now wears a prosthetic right leg, but is still a lifeguard and swim instructor. Fast forward to November 10th, 2020. So my friends were playing basketball, I was working out, and all of a sudden we just hear commotion, but it was like very surreal, so it was like time was really slow. I'm like looking around and I'm like, is there anyone in the water? And then from there, I just hopped over the bed thing where the rocks are. And I just started, you know, uh, taking off my, my leg and uh, I didn't even take off my shirt. I just went. Once I got to the car, I remember him panicking a little bit saying, you know, I can't swim. And luckily, um, he didn't have his seatbelt on. As soon as I pulled him out of the car, the car went under. So it was like hard for me to like get back to uh, shore. And then I just remembered um, calling my friend, uh, Lino. He's also a lifeguard and he uh, jumped in at the time. People like to say it's like a full circle moment because like my brother uh, saved me then and like he was a hero then. And just grateful uh, in receiving this award if I can just inspire other people to be more positive, help each other and more love. Clearly, incredible stories about courage and selflessness. Um, so I want to salute all of us, uh, together with the Berry Foundation, want to salute Anthony, Sister Francis, and our Middletown rescuers for their quick thinking and their very heroic actions. Now, this is the final group of honorees at this very special virtual ceremony. Um, 14 months ago, as we're doing this, when COVID-19 hit, devastation and fear across New Jersey, really across the nation, and so the next group of people were very aware that other people were losing their jobs. And the process of losing their jobs and losing money, income that they needed, there were problems in a range of areas, but especially when it came down to hunger and food and making a difference. Now let's take a look. Jerry Maziers from Elizabeth has been volunteering at St. Joseph's Social Service Center in Elizabeth for 19 years. He started as a young father raising two children and working nights, 
stopping in after work to help out. I work in a gas station night time, this time, you know, from the 8 to 8. Mm -hmm. And when I finish, you know, I, I stop over here from 9 o'clock to 11, 12. And first I start, you know, two, three hours, four hours. But later, when I see what they do over here for the people, you know, so I stay longer and longer. And it's, it's, you know, very, very nice when somebody come back. This is the, every week I have a, the schedule for a shopping in a food bank. Okay, so I take it two times a week, two pallets, I bring over here and we give it out. We have it also a special cleaning program, what I pick every week. Jerry continued to keep his volunteer work in his schedule over the years. And when COVID hit, he decided to keep showing up and he kept St. Joseph's food pantry stocked. That's true, but uh, you know, what I'm saying, you don't know where you can get this COVID. You know, I can go buy, buy ice cream, you know, I can get. So this better if I get when I help people. They make me happy because they go in a home and they say, you good today? Thank you, Jerry, we good. We have it food for all week. You know, we know there's nobody hungry. You know, they make you, make you happy. Phil Stafford of Wallington is founder of NJ Food and Clothing Rescue. Grit and heart have fueled Phil's volunteer efforts before and during COVID-19 to secure and redistribute food to vulnerable individuals at risk of falling through the cracks. In New Jersey, there's about 4 million pounds of food that usually gets thrown in the garbage. And we partner with uh, uh, organizations and stores and individuals and groups that whenever there's a, a, an overage of food, they contact me and I'll pick it up or they'll meet me somewhere and, and I'll get it. And then at the same time, I'm arranging with other people who can get it to their clients. And pretty much the same day, most of the food gets redistributed. In 1999, I lost everything I owned in 10 minutes flat because of flooding from Hurricane Floyd. So I was not in a good place mentally. And it took a long while for me to fight my way out of that. And uh, I said to myself, listen, you know, you could either continue like this, which isn't a good thing, or you can try to figure out something that makes you feel better. That's why I get up and do it. I've been there. I know what it's like. Every time I help somebody and they smile and I know they were in a bad position. And if I can make them smile, I don't think you could do anything more than that. Maria Torres of Newark became the manager of United Community Corporation's Champion House Food Pantry just weeks before the onset of COVID-19. Recently diagnosed with lupus, she was at extremely high risk, yet never wavered in her commitment to the community. As lockdowns and unemployment led to a huge rise in food insecurity, the number of people they served increased more than 1,000% over prior years. I started in February 13. It was my Valentine's gift from the director, saying that I got um, the position for manager here at the food pantry. About a month later, um, I was not feeling good, and they gave me the news that I got lupus. So I was dealing with um, coronavirus and lupus. But I told them I was not gonna shut down and I was not gonna let this um, lupus determine what I was supposed to do. And I know that the community needed us and we, I said, I'm not closing. So everybody was desperate because unemployment wasn't um, kicking in and they was like, I have a family, um, everything is closed down. I lost my food stamps, what I'm supposed to do. So I told them, you know, if I have food available, you go, you're welcome to come and pick up your grocery bags. Last year, I think it was 50,000 people that we service. And um, for me, that was a number that I, I, I was just looking at it like a maze of how many people we have touched over this 
past year with the COVID and everything. I seen a lot of people coming for the first time in a food pantry and they embarrass and I tell them do not feel embarrassed. You know, this is for everybody and anybody that needs. We're not here to judge you or nothing like that. We're here to help the community out. The bond and the family that I formed here with the community, like people um, calls me by my name, Maria. They got my personal cell phone number. So I, it's a family. Sometimes I call them when I don't see them. I, it's been two weeks, I don't see you, are you okay? So we become a family and all this. So I gain new friends, um, new family. So I take that. The volunteers are here because they were our clients. They want to give back. So they came here to help us out, giving out distribution. I have only eight staff, so on, on hands on board. I do hard work not to be on the cameras or to give me anything in advance. When I give, I give. And um, just by this, you know, it's not only me, it's my team, because I always say without them, I can't run United Community Corporation Champion Health. So they're a big part of this, of making it happen too. So um, they're my heroes. Dionisio Kakuda Jr., also known as Chef Dion, a Marine veteran from Teaneck, is described as an irreplaceable asset to his community. Recognizing that the COVID-19 pandemic created devastating food insecurity for many vulnerable residents in Bergen County, Chef Dion jumped into action. Drawing on his culinary background, he created Hot Wheels, hot dinners prepared from scratch for families at Bergen Family Center. He has since created Table to Table Tuesday, a raw food distribution program donated by Table to Table Food Rescue Organization. Chef Dion has also been a longtime mentor to young people through the Disabled Combat Veterans Youth Program and Englewood's Culinary Cadets Program. In 1977, I went into the Marine Corps and enlisted, and um, that's where I received my, uh, my trade, which is cooking. I spent um, three years on as a drill instructor, and then I decided that uh, you know, I had enough for the Marine Corps. I was young, and I got out. And then I stuck with the food service industry. 15 years ago, I was diagnosed with a lot of conditions due to my military injuries, and um, it resulted in me retiring because I just couldn't do it any longer. And I was, you know, mentoring youth, being a football coach here in Englewood. And next thing I know, I, I got this small nonprofit. I meet so many different people and different communities I'm involved in, and we share, you know, our likes. I get so many phone calls that folks have lost their jobs or their businesses have de diminished and declined. So. That gave me a huge indication knowing that folks are losing their jobs because as a result of the pandemic, knowing they got families, it's time for me to step it up and go into second gear and get the food. Uh, we stack the bags up and uh, with different kits in them and extra vegetables just in the bags. But as you'll notice, when the cars come up, they'll receive additional tomatoes, cucumbers, carrots that are in white bags. We don't know what we're receiving until we get it. And that's the fun part about it, because then we can get creative. Here we are, you know, 58 weeks later. I figure we'll do about 3,500 families. And um, we're pushing at 2 million meals already since last year. I have an amazing team. They really care. And, you know, they'll remind me of everything, because I'll forget who I am as I'm moving and navigating, because I just, I'm hands on. I just can't sit back and just watch my team work and I just stand there. You know, it's, um, it's a Marine Corps tradition, you know, you, you lead by example. You're the first one here and you're the last to go. I know that people really are me. Just to see my, my team and just to feel the love that we're giving to those that can't even love themselves at this point because of the confusion, I know it makes a difference. And that's all I want to do is make a difference and impact on people's lives. So there you have it, all of our honorees at this very special Making a Difference Award ceremony. Again, virtual, but no less significant. We congratulate all of you. 
Now, right now, it's my pleasure to once again introduce Angelica Berry to share some final thoughts. In this pandemic time, we are all called upon to be a hero. For 25 years, the Russell Berry Foundation has celebrated unsung heroes, ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And this was the vision of my late husband, Russ Berry. Today, a network of 380 Russ Berry Making a Difference awardees have become a force for good across the state of New Jersey. It is a time when our community needs everyday heroes, innovators, pioneers, problem solvers, social entrepreneurs. And these are the people we want to honor. At a moment when we face a global humanitarian crisis with so many families who have lost loved ones to COVID, 54 million Americans hungry, unemployed, and in danger of losing their homes, health care, and their faith in our society, we're called upon to act with generosity and compassion. Actions matter, whether it's organizing moving companies to mobilize resources, to distribute food that would otherwise go to waste or motivating high school students to clean up garbage. Every act creates a ripple effect that ignites positive change. Over 25 years, the collective impact of this resiliency network across 21 counties in New Jersey has made a powerful difference. In a time like this with lots of people impacted by the pandemic. We need this network of support. Our honorees and nominees in 21 counties across the, across the state have created an extra layer of support for nonprofits and philanthropy. We can all be a hero by doing something, no matter how small, that makes a difference in someone's life. And this is what we envision with this award, because philanthropy is not about money. It's the gift of who you are, your talent, time, resources, and the passion to make a difference. And no action is too small. As Greta Thunberg said, no one is too small to make a difference. Now it's my honor to recognize the trustees and the staff of the Russell Berry Foundation for their commitment for their work over the past 25 years. Job well done. I also want to show appreciation to two individuals who have contributed to this program over many, many years. Um, they've served as co-chairs of the advisory board for the Rustberry Making a Difference Awards, and both of them um, have stepped down from their roles this year. First, my good friend, our good friend, Josh Weston, honorary chairman of ADP, Automatic Data Processing. Congratulations, Josh, and also, Dr. Peter Mercer, President, Ramapo College of New Jersey. Best wishes to Josh as he continues to make a difference through his very charitable endeavors. And also, we wish Peter uh, Mercer a very happy retirement after leading Ramapo for over 16 years. And now it is my distinct honor, my privilege, to introduce the 2021 Rustberry Making a Difference honorees. Dionisio Kakuda Jr. Maria Torres, Kim Gaddy, Anthony Capuano, Sister Francis Salemi, Larry Abrams, Amanda Abacosia, Wilhelmina Holder, Emma and Quinn Joy. Jersey Jerry Maziars, the Middletown Teen Rescuers, Kieran Foley, Joseph Dietrich, Drew Scalisi, Ryan Day, and Tyler Armigan, Sharon Miller, Paul Nichols, Cheryl Olitsky, Lynn Regan, Phil Stafford, Paul Winslow, Donna York, Rosa Zaremba.
It has been my distinct honor to host the 25th anniversary of the Rustbury Making a Difference Awards. Uh, again, I want to thank the staff and the board of the Rustbury Foundation, Angelica, as our president. Uh, we thank all of you so very much. Thank you to the audience, all of you who are sharing this very special day. We hope and pray that we can be together in person next year. Um, we end the program by also thanking all of you who have nominated these unsung heroes who we recognize in this ceremony. Each one of you are making a difference every day in what you're doing. Now, I'm Steve Adubato. Um, I said it before, I'll say it again. It has been my honor, my pleasure to be a small part of a very big and important event with the Berry Foundation, making a difference every day.